in rowing you have goggles okay so they have designed new zealand people have designed goggles you just wear the goggles each time when they are doing the stroke how much force is being applied what speed you completed the stroke all those information coming now if i am applying ap i want to keep maintaining ap i can keep applying ap if my target is 80 minutes okay. so there is a automatic feedback of your training zone and you can keep doing the workout at that particular speed so uh, and also it will give you the ore whether the ore is not too deep into the water because in the ore also there are sensors which are being placed into the ore so you can get information how deep the contact of the ore is into the water in which angle it is all those information can be gathered so developing this kind of technology and that is getting a real time feedback that is very much important for advanced training <coughs> so same thing is with other sports almost like technologies in swimming you will find you can get your stroke length stroke frequency or if you want to see okay segmental part Okay, as soon as you cross the 50 meter, 25 meter, 35 meter, when you are going for turn, how much time you took on your turn, all those are small, small parameters which are like very important for swimming. Okay. <coughs> so this is in boxing nowadays, boxing, taekwondo, all they are there are smart gloves, there are sensors in it. So when you are punching, what is the force applied onto the opponent? How much of force contact was there in that? those kind of things yeah the cricket is gone to a uh, different world actually in terms of research a lot of research has been put up i'll just show you a, a research uh, which is which has come out like this it is still uh, not published so i but i'm just giving you some uh, idea about it uh, yeah so in badminton real time action smash speed about the equipment so i will be discussing this later uh just about some motion analysis okay so this is actually uh 3d motion analysis and here you can see a track trip that doing the track trip you know in hockey penalty corner situation track trip is there so that is actually uh how the setup is there we have just put that and uh, this was our my mechanics lab in malaysia and these are vans for calculations so we calculate from we have around we had around something like 25 cameras there so the ad of capturing it all depends like you see you can see so many cameras and the ad of capturing uh, is more if you actually limited number of cameras like six cameras then you get only just one by ten minutes here the capturing is limited up to this area only so when the athlete is crossing through this only you get that maybe one or two strikes so most of the gate labs in india they have only that kind of uh, uh, small area to capture so you have to do so many plans to actually analyze the gate motion that way <coughs> so these are some of the marker settings how the marker setting is there uh, for that way uh yeah here you can see here uh, after uh capturing the video and how it looks and the information which actually comes in after uh analyzing you can come to know each and every speed of angle velocity segmental movements whether the uh, all those information each and every joint because there are so many marks in the body so from each segment which you really want to look into you can get information and if you have a force plate added into the system you will get you will get force information like now for example when you are walking when you are contacting the heel down on the ground okay whether how much of brake force is applied so if you want the gate to be continuous in nature 
Okay, if you have too long stride, then brake force is relatively higher. So same thing in running. If you are having too long stride, if your ankle joint is ahead of the knee joint while in the contact point, then your running motion, there is a lot of brake force. So that can lead to ankle injury, knee injury, hip injury, and go back and So you want to have your running economy better, probably you need to reduce the stride length. You have to have optimum stride length which can help you in running relatively smoother and performing better. And you also get to know medial forces which are acting onto the foot or lateral forces, whether we are landing on lateral aspect of the feet or medial aspect of the feet and so on. So that's about the, the gait aspect. And this we keep on doing a lot of research because this is on weight lifting. So you can see, see the markers up upon the and there is actually a, a force plate down below and there are two force plates either side. <coughs> so even on the bar Anyone? 
medial aspect. That is it. Towards the midline of the body, whereas in the finger spin, back spin, and wrist spin, top spin, the palm of the baller points laterally. So it is more on to the. Uh, so this is lateral side and this is medial side. So this is medially is actually being projected and this one projects on to the lateral side. Okay. So information on uh, bowling, uh, which can actually give you a lot of. Uh, uh, Info for batsman, uh, how you need to counter this kind of actions. Okay, and so you can see based on different positions, the spin of the ball. Okay, how fast the ball is because the axle maker is there in the ball, so you can come to know how fast the spin of the ball is taking place. So a small technology of having an axle maker. Magnetometer and the gyroscope fitted into the ball gives you all this kind of information. <laughs> all right, uh, can we take a break? Okay, we'll take five minutes. Okay, please. Break. Time starts now. Please come back in time. Don't miss. Five minutes.
So that, that's how you need to be efficient in terms of giving feedbacks, or mechanical feedback, or any, any kind of feedback. <coughs> okay. Okay, so there are many things in start techniques which needs to be looked into. Even uh, the, the in relation to the water, how much of your, you know, you, when you are actually doing the stroke mechanics, how much your elbow is dropping and the angle, elbow angle. In start techniques, okay, body positioning is very much important. In takeoff, when during the takeoff, you find some other people are having some kind of, you know, uh, like a aerial, the training leg is raised. So what happens when your tail goes up, your head drops down. So your angle of uh, got a lot of span pops. So this actually can lead to injury. So here, if you, take, if you look into this, uh, this is mainly because in the start block. You have a knee angle of immediately less than 90 degrees. So what happens in the knee extension? The knee is hyperextended during the takeoff position. So here one thing is that okay, relatively the stance, the center of gravity is low. So because of that, hyperextension is taking place. And because of the hyperextension, what's actually happening? The counter reaction of knee flexion is taking place, and that leads to a kind of injury. And also performance will reduce. That means your time in the air will be more, and that will result in dropping of the uh, the angle of entry into the water will be relatively straight. And uh, instead of having a 45 degree angle or 35 degree angle of entry into the water, which will facilitate you to have a smoother glide pace, instead of that you will have vertical landing. And that will affect the drag. I mean, that will uh, have a lot of drag on the top of bottom. So those things will reduce your running speed. Okay, how many of you are swimmers here? How many of you are swimmers? Nobody. So being Bangalore coast, so near, no one goes for swimming in sea. No one. So if uh, your people are taken for some picnic into some coastal areas, you have to be very careful. Nobody should be allowed, they should be allowed in to enter in to enter into water. Uh, but we have a coach here actually, our coach is actually a swimmer, he is a recreational swimmer. So okay. Right. <coughs> now why I ask the question swimming is that uh, let, let me uh, just for discussion later. Like uh, when you are doing swimming, okay, applying force, in which angle are you applying force? That means I am now my body is in relation to water horizontal. Whether I apply force here or here or this this 90 degree position or I mean 90, 45 or 180. 45, 90. 45. When you start actually applying force? From 45 to 90. Stop, stop. Okay, let's keep simple. Okay, 1, uh, point 0.1, yes. point 0.2, point 0.3. 45 to 90. 1 and 2. 1 and 2. 2 to 3. Two to three. Okay, how many of you say 1? Click raise your hand. How many of you say 2? Yeah, click raise your hand. Oh, very good. I thought now I have an elbow problem, shoulder problem, so now I am able to raise the hand. Okay. okay, two. Very good. Okay, three. Three. Only two people, but three people. Okay. Good, yeah, I mean, I think now I can see. No comments. Uh, <laughs> okay, the both application phase. Uh, as I said here, most people who said 3 is actually the right. Now, what happens when you are actually applying force in number 1? Okay, number 1. So, you are pressing hand against the water. So, buoyancy force, it pushes you.
continue upward. So you will find many people who will be slapping the water, that comes and help you. And they are not moving forward. Why? They are pushing against the buoyancy. That's why they are remaining in the same place. They don't swim. But they have a lot of you know, frequency of strokes are there, but they are not moving forward. Whereas in two, relatively when you actually push, you are actually also applying force, but what happens is that unnecessarily your body will be going up and up. Okay? So in, in terms of speed in water, you will be having a lot of power. Unnecessarily your body is going up and down like a lot of wind is going. So instead of swimming fast, you tend to lose your speed in speed. So in third, actually the force application phase. And in that also very much important when you are actually applying force, very much important that the angle of your arms in force application. Okay? The arm position in force application. What do you call this position here? By I mean, physiotherapy. Oh, physiotherapy for the What what do you call it? Now, now that Shoulder of the Why? Caption. 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 Okay. You don't have Okay, anyway. Uh, simple. Uh, that's why I think we use much of the terms here because many of the education people and uh, they need not get uh, too many high tech terms. That's why I'm just talking in layman's terms, okay? <coughs> and uh, I'm intentionally asking you some of the terms because, yeah, sometimes some important parts need to be understood by others also. So in this portion, when you actually apply force, okay, you can see that, okay, what you do? You keep your left hand on your pectoral muscle, keep shoulder, elbow, wrist in this line, and try to press down. Try, try. Elbow, wrist. See, importance is elbow, wrist, and shoulder. El shoulder, elbow, wrist. On one line. When you are applying force, do you feel the pectoral muscle contracting? Yes. Anyone whose muscle is not contracting, please let me know. Okay. All of them. Okay. Very good. So, here you find the muscle is contracting. That means bigger muscle is contracting in order to apply the force. But you keep it higher, relatively lesser. So the maximum force application is when it is in this position. Okay. Alright. Now you keep your elbow bit higher, wrist and shoulder in one line. Wrist and shoulder in one line, elbow higher. Okay, now keep the hand on the pectoral muscle and then try to press down. Is the pectoral muscle working? Sir, you need to keep the hand on the pectoral muscle to uh, feel that okay. You are just doing the technique. <laughs> what is it? Tata. <laughs> okay. Is it okay? When your elbow is higher than the shoulder and wrist and you try to press down, your muscle is not working. Your contraction of the arm does not take place. So it changes in the angle, angle of execution, cuts off your bigger muscle and actually if you keep on your right deltoid, you keep the hand fingers on your right deltoid and then when you see, you feel that okay, the right deltoid is activating but pectoral is not active. So instead of working in the bigger group of muscle, you are making a smaller group of muscle to activate. That results in injuries in swimming. When times it results in injury. So people who are actually using smaller group, and you know that in swimming they do something around 4 to 6 kilometers per day. 4 to 6 kilometers means something around 6,000 strokes. 6,000 to 8,000 strokes they are doing, okay, per day. So, uh, making you talk your muscles for 6,000 to 8,000 repetitions per day will make the muscle to be overused and that results in injuries. So, probably you need to understand
understand the mechanics as a coach or as a physiotherapist you need to understand the mechanics of swimming where force application is how the force application is how to activate the muscles which are actually bigger in nature which can produce greater force those information needs to be understood by you okay all right uh, let's have a discussion here okay there's the observation start technique I know most of you are not swimmer, but then just ask. Okay, start technique, backstroke. Okay, this is all backstroke. Now there are four techniques. Uh, here, four athletes are doing. Here you can see that knee angle is like this. Here you can see the very hip is slightly behind. Knee angle is almost similar to that, but elbow flex. The whole body immerse in water. This guy, okay, elbow flex, 90 degree, 70 degree knee flexion, upper back spring. So out of this four technique, which technique is best? How many say four? Please raise your hand. Yes. Okay. How many say three? How many say two? Nobody is supporting two. Why? How many say is number one? No one supports number one. Or oh, you all have suggested, or just uh, saw three and four people being next level. Actually, all the four techniques are bad. <laughs> He is actually dipping in the water when actually pushing. He has so much of drag away. If he is also doing the same thing. He is laughing us, so when we put back so much of water on us, we encounter this guy's shoulder is down below, so he is actually hanging. So, so these are the things, you know, so much of drag when she is actually pushing, knee extension is taking place, so much of drag effect is there. And then fall back, again, for the points he pushes you up. So time taken is for you to come out of the water is relatively long. And see this guy. By the time he extends his back, body position is like this, and he lands on the water like this. And that will again points he pushes him back much more. So your time to really uh, take off your first stroke also it is going to be longer, and you will not need a question to do the. That means you lose a lot of loss of time is taking place, and time is the resultant. So ideally something like this. See, the shoulder should be higher than the wrist. Upper back straight. TBL parallel to the palm. Okay. And when it's extending, the whole body extended, and there is an arch. That extension leads to an arch. So you are avoiding so much of water contact. So your drag on in the water will be relatively less, and you will have. and lead over others in the start again <coughs> okay so this is actually a skill analysis uh, part now many times uh, when a hurdler is uh, running over the hurdle people only start take the time of start and finish but now they see the in between hurdles what is the time taken for each hurdle okay hurdle one hurdle two hurdle three hurdle four hurdle five So this was only a five hurdles trial. So we looked into some take off time, flight time, flight time, landing, what I can, and what are the body position when it actually, how much time it takes from here to here. So because the take off distance matters. If the distance is more, the flight time in inches will be higher, and landing also will be higher. And the angle of projection, all those things are very much important for looking into your hurdles clearance. How fast you can clear the hurdle. So small small factors which are performance oriented needs to be tracked down in order to help the athlete to run over the hurdle faster. Okay. Uh, okay, this one we can discuss later on. Uh, this is okay. Okay, this is a start on. Yeah. Okay, this is uh, a sprinter having pain in left foot metatarsal. So here you can see the running technique when he is landing in that. So what we did is that okay, we inserted a uh, uh, a sheet of 
just to look into his central pressure and where actually the foot can uh, foot is actually contacting. So this is a polar unit which is used for uh, measuring all foot pressure, basically foot pressure in temperature. So you can see this is the first contact is on the lateral aspect and then gradually it is being shifted to the main stance. So the time taken from landing from lateral and stabilizing to the neutral position is going to be increasing. And here you can see a small tracking. See a small dog here, you can see a small dog and the dog is falling backward. So what is that actually happening? The center of pressure is falling backward. That means negative acceleration. That's deceleration is taking place in the body. Negative acceleration. So instead of athlete running forward, this placement of the foot is actually bringing its body weight or center of pressure backward. And then again it is pushing out. So after stabilizing only, the center of pressure is being shifted into the front foot, and that is actually enabling the athlete to move forward. Okay, so uh, here landing on the lateral aspect, stabilizing, and then shifting the center of pressure into the main foot, and then facilitating you to push forward. So this much of time, the time frame of you know the center of pressure dropping down from here, and then traveling back is increasing your foot contact time on the ground. So this is actually a sprinter. A sprinter if you have this kind of movement in the body, okay, then your running speed is going to reduce. So because the contact time is more, your running speed will be increased. So if you want to reduce your running speed, that means if you want to reduce your time, you have to cut off this spot. So your running mechanics has to be corrected. So in running mechanics, first thing is okay, orientation of foot landing. So probably a lot of ABC of running mechanics have to be learned by that way. How the foot contacts, what is the position of the foot in landing and related when they actually, it's all because the raising of the foot, okay, I mean hip joint. So the orientation, if it is knee is out or I mean it's not in line or not swinging in the pendulum relatively in a pendulum model or it is just having an internal rotation or external rotation based on that the orientation of the foot also will be changing. So strengthening of the hip joint is relatively important and placement of the foot that orientation of pawing in. Pawing is, is a particular technique in uh, ABC of uh, springs. Those things have to be mastered and then put the athlete back into action. So, uh, this kind of things it helps you to assess the athlete's running mechanics. Okay. So, this again, uh, this is actually looking into grass technique. You can here you can see, okay, again, the weight is actually shifted from slightly from the lateral aspect into the median, but relatively better. But here you can see, see a slight shift of weight is there, central pressure is there backward, initially after contacting. So if they can reduce this, probably you may be improving your time by 0.0001 second. And in 100 meters, let us say your stride length is uh, something like 2 meters. So in right leg, Oh, sorry, here it's left leg. So if you have 2 meters right leg, then probably 50 steps, what was that? 25 steps. For 25 steps, if you can reduce your time by 0.0001 into 25, your time for each step is reduced, means your running speed will be improved. So this is how people need to work on technical corrections, specified technical corrections. It's a long process. You need to streamline the athlete, make the athlete to really understand all these things and work out as this schedule. Technique corrections has to be done specifically and it has to be monitored and a lot of feedback needs to be given. Then only the athlete will be Okay? Get this out of the Alright. Uh, thank you for the first session. So I'll just go to the next part.
important is called running mechanics as we are little insight into running mechanics.
pull the arm, there is a lot of shoulder and pelvic anterior posterior movements that is taking place. Okay. <coughs> so basically in running, two forces, two external forces of nature act on the body. One is the force of gravity and second one is Newton's third law of opposing force. That is okay. for every action, <coughs> there is always an equal and opposite reaction. So here you can see that okay, in a walking gait, when, when you are landing, there is an opposite force. When you are pushing up also, there is an opposite force. If you don't push against the ground, then you are stride length or you are not applying force in order to move forward. Okay, so the, that, that is the, again two aspects, pushing force and pulling force. Okay, so here force of gravity, is depending upon your aligned posture, that means from ear lobe, shoulder, your hip and your ankle joint almost almost in a straight line. Okay. So any deviations from this makes your body posture be a bit misaligned and that will have honestly uh, additional energy expenditure and so on. Okay. So force of gravity is uh, that is the running or walking, external propulsion, uh, propulsion by a forward lean. So there is, there needs to be a forward lean, angle of lean forward. That will automatically make the line of center of gravity to fall outside the base. Okay. Allowing the line of center of gravity to fall outside the base, that facilitates a falling action and makes you to walk fast. Now I am just asking in a badminton situation, okay, let's say there is an athlete who is playing badminton, has a wide stance and there is a person who is having a narrow stance, relatively a narrow stance. Out of these two, if the shuttle comes on to the right, who would react faster? Why? Support is more. Yeah, what is that? He, he acquired less space. Ah. That's why he, uh, he had less balance. Ah. Uh, then he will move faster. Greater the base, like. Greater the base, greater the stability. Greater the base, greater the stability. Okay. Then anything else? Huh? Fifty point. Fifty point. What? Shoulder. Upper 
upper extremity uh, shoulder shoulder opposite leg direction the force again generated through this lower limbs Okay, <coughs> so forward lean, okay, so 
you can see the heat relatively has a quite degree lean power that facilitates the ability to automatically enable the line of centrogravity for forward beyond the base with that that facilitates it to run faster. Okay. <coughs> so third law of Newton again during the landing. Okay. When landing also as, as I told you in the first session, if you are landing with the heel, brake force will be relatively high and that will cause some injuries. And so you need to see appropriate stride length should be there while you are landing that will reduce the uh, injuries and efficiency of running gain. So every time we know that okay, principles of motion, Newton's third law, when you push against the ground, the ground also pushes you back. If there was no third law of Newton available, then probably if you are pushing down the ground, the ground would have gone down and you would have been six feet down. Okay. <coughs> So, force of approaching the ground, feet land under the posture line while moving with the with this force. Okay. Uh, then force of leg swing. Force of leg swing is quite important because it controls your attack and there's internal or external rotation. Now the speed in which you are swinging the leg, okay, that controls your internal or external movement of the hip joint, whether it is going medially or it is going laterally. <coughs> then, yeah, uh, this I uh, already explained, uh, yeah, ground reaction force. Okay, is this is the natural way to run, okay. So you can see a small child when actually uh, kids when they are running, actually they have good posture running mechanics, it is automatically coming in. So you can see that here go shoulder, uh, hip joint and ankle joint almost in one line, one alignment. And since the body weight is falling, falling forward, automatically the propulsion will be there from the foot, you know, like a round cycle, you know, it will be just actually like a cycle. So, <coughs> so, how does running takes place? Running is just a control form. So, whenever the line of central gravity falls outside the base of the body, the body tends to fall forward. So, the placement of each foot, uh, placement of foot each time when you have a tendency to fall, it leads to a running mechanics. Okay. Okay. Postural pelvis. Postural alignment, uh, sorry, postural alignment uh, with level of pelvis. So, when we are running, pelvis is parallel to the ground. You can see, pelvis is parallel to the ground. And here, in this athlete, whenever the athlete is running, you see there is a drop in pelvis. There is also a shoulder drop also relatively. So, this kind of running mechanics actually is maybe because of injury aspects. You can find that injured athletes, they tend to have this kind of uh, running mechanics. <coughs> so normally, it's running, people who have low back issues, they tend to have pelvis movement where obliquity takes place. That means every time when you are running, there is a lot of uh, obliquity or tilt. That means there is angular tilt or posterior tilt every time you are running. And there is leading to anterior or posterior, either that is maybe sometimes the force when the left leg is in front, the left pelvis is leading or and uh, right is trailing or sometimes right is when the right leg is forward, right is leading and the other one is trailing. So this may take place clockwise or counterclockwise. These movements may take place either way. So <coughs> in running technique, head up and looking up forward, okay, always when you are running, head up, you put your neck down, automatically it changes your spinal cord, okay, so the spinal position also automatically, vertebral position automatically changes depending upon the orientation of your neck, so always have your neck position straight, midfoot, uh, when it is actually landing, Okay, during the mix 
distance, in case of long distance runners, you, and in case of sprinters, we can find that in, in case of long distance runners, they will have almost a flat foot landing, whereas in case of sprinters, you will find that okay, they tend to have uh, more of four foot landing. Now, see the foot, flow foot contact angle, you can find that okay, if a person is having more of a uh, front foot landing, this is actually more of front foot landing, then that is the better efficiency and uh, mechanics of running. If it is landing, so that means that it is more on back, contacting more on heel and towards the heel, then probably the running mechanics is relatively poor and here yeah, you need to have your uh, stride length adjusted according to the running pattern. And this stride length and all these things actually changes according to the speed of running. So this is actually uh, running on a treadmill. So when that person is running at 12 kilometers, 14 kilometers, 16, 18, 20 kilometers, you can find that okay, left leg, the contact angle for this, right leg contact angle. So in lower speed, you find sometimes this is actually this athlete is not consistent. There has been variations relatively. In 16, he had more, you know, uh, foot landing, more of this type. But in higher speeds, he is shifting to the front foot. In right leg, also the same issue, the variations. But in 16, he had relatively. Uh, see, the normal is 17.47. But in 16 kilometers, the okay, case so he was more of landing on the E towards the E. But as and when, or uh, higher speed, relatively the front foot contact is more. So according to running speed, the foot orientation of foot uh, in relation to the ground, the angle of foot contact in relation to the ground may vary. <coughs> okay. Okay. So. Running forward lean from relaxed angles. So every time when you are running, the ankle joints should be relaxed. If it is too tight, then actually the brake force is going to be relatively higher. And then having a heel kick. Okay, see so you see that heel is almost uh, in the phase of running. The heel is almost contacting the butt. Okay, so there are athletes who have heel kick technique and there are athletes who have who are actually called as terrestrial, terrestrial runners. Terrestrial runners means they don't have any kick, they will have the legs just raised from the ground and they'll just keep that. Okay. So in, in between these two athletes actually what is actually the problem I think you know this so this is actually alien runner. Here you can find terrestrial runner. Okay. See the leg after raising it is actually coming. Whereas, you can see here, relatively shorter radius, okay. So, the efficiency of core is better because of shorter radius, the speed of rotation would be higher. Now, this guy, he doesn't have a good heel kick, so his radius of rotation is longer. That means, if you just take this segment alone, hip joint to the toe and cut the hip joint to toe and see the radius of rotation, it is taking longer time, each stride is going to increase. I mean, the time taken for the swing phase is increasing because longer radius takes more time to run, cover the stride and shorter radius relatively will be moving faster. So, how efficient you can make your run is by reducing your uh, this segment to a shorter one that will facilitate you to run faster. Okay. Now heel kicks. Okay, see so here. Indifference in this actually the heel kick. Some some have almost in line with the knee joint. Sometimes these guys they even they are unable to lift up to that. So relatively uh, hip flexion, too much of hip flexion while landing, too much of knee flexion. Then high knee action is another important thing. Optimum high knee action ensures greater stride length. So if you have good 
uh, optimum mining action that will facilitate you to cover more. If you have just less mining action, distance covered is less, higher you can cover relatively better, I mean better more, uh, relatively more distance, okay. And then pelvic tilt. Pelvic tilt plays an important role. Anterior pelvic tilt and posterior pelvic tilt. So in anterior pelvic tilt, you find people who are having anterior pelvic tilt, they have tight erector spinae and tight iliac hip flexors. So what will happen is that if you actually look into, because of this anterior tilt, they have better drive. That means the force application in the drive phase will be relatively good. And in posterior pelvic tilt, the orientation of the pelvis is slightly backward. So they have tight abdominals and tight hamstrings. So, and, but then these people have better high knee action. If you look into relatively, they have better high knee action. Okay. Uh, but the dry face is not much. When these people apply force, they have more of vertical component of force transfer. Whereas this one will have more horizontal transfer of force. So which is more required for running fast. Okay. So this kind of people you have they can go for high jump, volleyball, basketball, where you need to jump vertically, so we can also have a selection of talent based on the orientation of the pelvis. Because the arrangement of muscles, all those things in that is really Different. Okay. <coughs> so high knee action see here, you can see this, uh, see this guy is doing high knee action, but the orientation of the knee is that of the body. Okay. So this is basically because of weakness in core strength. Uh, they don't have proper core uh, strength ability, that is one of the reasons that all this kind of funny. Then arm strength. You can see here. While they are being the run, if they have a wider angle of shoulder, then actually you are protecting your upper arm a lot. Okay, if you have arms close to your body, your running mechanics is better and relatively trunk stability is better. So, as you must have seen weightlifters or wrestlers, they tend to have bigger V shaped shoulders and because of wider. Shoulders, they tend to have more of rotation, so you can find some trunk. Actually, their body is rotating too much. Okay. <coughs> elbow angle also plays an important role. Okay, so when elbow is flexed 90 degrees, shorter radius, rotation, radius of rotation. If you have elbow open, then what will happen is longer radius of rotation. Loading on shoulder joint is relatively going to be higher. Your time factor will be reduced. Then, yeah, shoulder and pelvic drop downs. Yeah, so here basically weight displacements will be taking place because of dropping downs. So, again, as I showed earlier, we need to see that okay, the pelvic and shoulder needs to be parallel to each other and parallel to the ground while they are running. So that will help you to increase the pace of running. <coughs> okay. So and yeah, this you see while running, this almost leaning backward. Here you can find that the person is almost running in straight line, slightly over leaning, and there's a curvature of body curvature. Lower. He is trying to lean. So instead of putting his head forward, he is putting his abdomen forward. So that further reduces speed. So uh, this happens in athletes who are actually running in 400 meters and all. Because in there, when they are doing the struggle to uh, do the last 50 meters run sprint. So you can find that many times these people they have backward leans. <coughs> okay, so this I have already explained. Now, one of the most important thing here are uh, running propulsion. This is a combination of three groups of muscles the calf muscle, quadriceps, and the 
glutes. Okay, so it's a combination of these three. If there is a knee flexion of 157, so whether this guy is actually contributing 100 percent muscle contraction or not.
land and on B. So <coughs> your efficiency of one depends upon that. Yeah, foot strike, feet generally land in front of the body, then too much of the break. Okay. So you tend to have a lot of impacts, ankle joint, palm muscle, knee joint, hamstring, quad, low back, hip joint, all these things tend to have a lot of impacts if there is too much of break force. <coughs> Uh, most of the injured athletes, when they are running, you find that okay, they will be having a knee angle flexion of 130 degrees in this main stand space. You see here, the injured leg 130 is one, almost 129. So you find that injured leg, <coughs> the angle of uh, knee flexion during the main mid stand space will be around 130 degrees and non-injured leg may be around 145 to 150 degrees. Okay, <coughs> uh, here is a question for you. There are some abnormal, he is actually a sprinter. There are some abnormal movements identified in the sprinter. So here you can see uh, the arm string is wide away from the body. Here you can see uh, during the heel kick, the knees, if you look into a line of hip joint, the knee is medial, okay, inward. And during the high knee action, the same athlete, in relation to the mid section of the body, the knee is going across the body. And while landing on the foot, on right leg, he is landing on the lateral aspects of the foot, right foot. Okay, now my question is, what would be the cause of this running mechanics? Is the right arm swing, is it the hip joint, or is it the ankle joint aversion? <coughs> what would be the problem of this athlete running like this? Number one. Right arm swing, hip 
joined or anti joined, so most of you have said, yeah, all three. But the main reason, let's discuss, okay. Now, these are all actually effect of counter movements, okay. Why the knee is going inward? Left knee is going inward. Okay. Left swimming. Which is heavier? Leg is heavier. Okay. So, in order to compensate the heavier movement, which is going inward, you are throwing your hand outward. Otherwise, what will happen every time I am running? After what? I am spinning. If I don't put my hand outside, what will happen? Every run. One round spin. I have to spin and run. So, your running mechanics is having problem. So, in order to compensate this movement, you are actually having your hands being thrown outwards. If I don't throw this, yes, it will still rotate. So, that is counter. Now, here the knee is going inward. It is going inward. Do you need that? Knee kick, it is going inward. Now, if I don't control it by outward, my body again will rotate. So in order to counter that, my foot is forming outward. So where would be the problem? The problem is in this hip one. Hip joint. The core is not good. The core is not strong enough. So you need to work more on to the core. So if you can stabilize your core, uh, all this your running mechanics becomes and instead of going inward, if it is coming straight like this, then this arm, will, arm swing will go automatically, it will be cut off. If this is going outward, then it actually, it can restrict this outward movement of Your foot orientation of toe will be straight. So, identify the problem. Most of the time, you find the problem which is actually initiating from the core. <coughs> okay. So, weak core muscles make you to have all kind of internal and external movements. You actually track, if you are doing a tracking of the running mechanics, you can find all that. So, this is like a tracking of knee. If it is moving straight like that, okay, see this left leg is moving straight, but then there is the right leg, lot of internal and external movement is taking place. Okay. <coughs> yeah. So, pelvic tilt, all these things are taking place because of that. Okay, here there is one classic example of running. Cross foot movement in heel kick can cause external rotation of hip joint. So, here you can see one athlete, when he is running, his right, right leg is hitting the left buttocks and his left leg is hitting the right buttocks. Okay. That means when you see from back, you will find it's going to cross. So there the pelvic is actually swinging forward and backward. That means anterior and posterior movement is relatively very high. Okay. And because of that, the front foot during the landing, there is severe torsion that is taking place. And you see the knee is placed relatively. If you look into the landing of the ankle joint, it's not vertically over that, it's slightly away from that, both the sides. Okay, now what could be the cause of this kind of problems? What could be the cause of this kind of So in order to do, uh, find out this problem, what I did, okay, well, I did an EMG study. Okay, so I put EMG, you can see on the hamstring, Bicep femoris and semi tendinous, I put both the legs. So, when, if you look into, when the left leg is doing the exercise, okay, when the left leg is doing the exercise, bicep femoris and semi tendinous are activating almost equally, okay. And I also put it with the gastrocnemius, lateral gastrocnemius and medial gastrocnemius, also I put to see if there was 
own activation from there, but then relativity, lateral gas of mimes and medial gas of mimes in terms of left leg, slightly over activating, not a big concern for me. But when they are doing the exercise on the right leg, you find that bicep tendonitis is activating 85 percent and semitendinous is activating only something around uh, 15.15 percent. Okay, so out of 100 percent activation, the bicep tendonitis, that is the inner muscle, that is more medial muscle, is activating more as compared to the muscle which is on the outer side, lateral. Now, what would be the cause of this problem? Anyone? Lack of stabilization. Lack of stabilization. Okay. Yes, one it could be one other. <coughs> any 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 other comments? Planning. Food planning inside. Yeah, why? Any other? Oh, I thought you stood up to answer something. You want to? You want to answer? Ah, yeah, yeah. Finish, finish. <coughs> Lack of lower back strength. Okay, lower back strength. All right. Now, if you look into the start of the exercise, okay, the hip joint, knee joint, ankle joint, very well placed. It is in a straight line. So, when you are doing, when you are in a straight line, when you are doing the exercise, automatically the biceps femoris and semitendinous will be activated, activated together and then you get pulling like a pulley <coughs> upward. Okay. So, activation is supposed to be equal. So, we like the left leg is almost 62.2 and 62.7, almost 50 50 percent. But if you look into the position of the body in relation to the room, is it straight or slightly tilted? It is slightly tilted. So what happens in the angle of pull? The pull is more onto the inclined way. That means when the knee flexion is taking place, the bicep femoris tends to activate more because the angle of pull is in the medial aspect. So you find bicep femoris activating more than semitendinous. From the initial activity is equal, but as and when it is coming towards the flexion, so here the heel is going towards the opposite buttocks. The angle, so actually pulling angle is more towards the opposite buttocks. So your training in the gym has to be totally supervised by your coach or conditioning expert or the physiotherapist or the rehabilitation rehabilitating person. If you don't set the person in relation to the equipment, your body posture is not set according to the uh, relation to the equipment. You tend to develop wrong angle of pull, and that wrong angle of pull which you are doing in training will lead to your body mechanics of pull having the right leg going to the left hip joint. Okay, now there is one question left to be answered. Now you see here, left leg is having equal, but why is that? Now, why is the left leg is going and hitting the right back? So, as per the first thing, the theory explained that okay, bicep femur is over activating, that's why it is being put, right is being put to the left. But left leg, if you see, it is equal. Why is that left leg heel is going and hitting the right buttocks? Because of the counter force. Counter force. Yes. Right.
one thing is a cyclic activity. Is repetitive one. So one side, if the force is acting like this, it will always make the other side also to work in that way. So that's why you find that left leg also has similar pattern of running, and that is actually going to reduce your running speed. So my advice to strength and conditioning expert or physical education teachers or physiotherapists or rehabilitators when you are training always have the body posture aligned to the road. Many times I see that okay people are doing exercise you know they put a thara band on the thigh and put it on the wall but the body is like this and they are doing this. Tomorrow they will be running like this. <laughs> you, you are creating a situation like that. So in order to have stability properly, you may have a grip or something, a bar or some stool or something in front of you. Have these two are aligned in proper direction, position, and then go for doing the exercise. Don't do overdo it. Don't have to exercise in a wrong way, which develops other people. Okay. All right. Any other questions? I think uh, yeah. So smooth running technique and plan may have guarantee high movement and low resistance, very high energy efficiency, reduces discomfort, freedom from aches, pains, and injuries, speed enhancement, effective rehabilitation, and ensures faster run and return to. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Yes. Keep break. Yeah. Yeah. This can go for. I mean, if you don't have to sit, you can go for deep. So that at least was bad for people can be served. Yeah. Continue.
have some boxes. Now, for example, if I am doing exercise like this, I am doing meditation like this, or like this way, we will have the summation of force generated vertically. So, if I keep some blocks down by below my knee, what will happen to my orientation of the foot? I mean, the lower extremity, the knee, the TTS will be now more towards dorsal flexion. Okay, now the muscle is now the angle of rotation is working in a related in a different direction. That will change the summation of force production into linear aspect, and that can be used for athletes who are doing dorsal flexion or spinning activities. Where you intend to have force production linear.
doing namaz uh, in Muslim prayer. They say, she said that okay, they put uh, uh, on the lamba um, and go back uh, on the census and they looked into lower back and lower extremity muscle activation during praying. That means they have to get up so many times, you know, while doing namaz. So, uh, and they compared to, they are doing a comparison to a ordinary forward bend and reach position. So in this position, you will come like this, bending and standing like this, and reach position. They compared that. And they found that, okay, namas doing activity enables them to have better muscle activation, so everybody should do namas. Okay. But in the exercise where they selected for the person to do the thing, he is holding a chair. When you hold a chair and you rest your body, there is no much activation that is taking place in the, because your stability contact point is there on the bench. That reduces the muscle activation in the lower back. They just wanted to bring the 90 degree position. So in order to bring the 90 degree position, they had the position there. So I asked the person who was presenting whether this muscle activation is concentric, eccentric, or isometric. She never had any answer to me. Comparison is done in a static condition or in a uh, concentric mode of contraction or eccentric mode. In all these three variations, the muscle activation will vary. So you need to be careful in which mode of contraction you are doing the test. That needs to be understood. Then, phase of training. In coaching, there is when the athlete is being training, there is actually general phase of training where you may have preparatory period one, preparatory period two, preparatory period that may be depending upon the uh, type of training you are doing or specific preparatory period general preparatory period and specific preparatory period in general preparatory period you do things which are general in development of overall fitness but in specific preparatory period you tend to have specific activity which is related to your particular sport country even country they go for doing that so the exercise and the intensity and the volume of training during these two phases are totally different. Okay, so you have any doubt, we have athletic coach here. You can ask him what is being done in general preparatory period and what is being done in specific preparatory period. <coughs> then, <coughs> muscle fatigue. Now, when the muscle is tired and you go and put your uh, electrodes on him, and then if you test, then probably again, that will have negative results of activation. Okay. And frequency of trials. Okay. How many times, if you are collecting a data, whether you are collecting 5 trials, 10 trials, 15 trials, 25 trials, 30 trials, 100 trials. As and when the muscle is fatigued, <coughs> when you have more number of repetitions, muscle tends to get fatigued. So the activation pattern may be gradually going down. So if your intention is okay on the fatigue condition you are testing, it is a different result altogether. If you are doing under fresh condition, it is different results altogether. So must understand the situation of the muscle whether it is fatigue or not. Now I am just giving an example. Now strength and conditioning as we have when our athletes are being tested. Our strength and conditioning experts did the back strength test. They did when the athletes came Monday morning after two days rest, they were fresh enough, they did the test and they found that okay, the athletes have having good back strength. Now the physiologists did the same test end of the week. Monday the morning training was there, evening training was there, Tuesday morning, evening, Wednesday morning, evening, Thursday morning, evening, Friday morning, evening, and Saturday they did the test. So already 12, 5 to uh, 10 training sessions workload has been completed. 
you, when you pain, you get fatigue and when you are uh, recovery uh, is taking place, second session is taking place. So, what you see is that there is certain amount of summation of fatigue towards the weekend. Okay, towards the end of the week you have, and under fatigue condition you are going and testing. When they tested, they found that, okay, back strength is poor. Because under fatigue condition they tested and they said, this athlete's performance is poor. Now move to Billy. So we have to understand the time when the test is done, what were the loads which was given in the previous training session, understand the type, the total volume, what was the RPE, you know what is the RPE? Yes, rate of pulsing exertion. So you understand what RPE it was and according to that you figure out the load part and also the uh, percent status of the athlete. <coughs> so based on that you need to do the test. Okay. So these are some of the guidelines which are, but I am not going for uh, giving you any information on okay how the data is uh, calculated. <coughs> procedures I am not going to explain here. Uh, directly I am just going on with what has been done and how they are doing. Okay. Now this is actually a uh, shoulder pain in a butterfly's growth swimmer. So basically it is a muscle activity in a swimmer while exhibition simulated stroke mechanics. Okay. He is a butterfly swimmer. So simulated the uh, different isometric angles as well as in isotonic of speedy. And I am just only putting the isometric uh, results here. So the electrodes were put in Mysis Branky, anterior deltoid, pectoralis major and infraspinal, both right and left. Okay. So here you can see that okay, uh, we used the uh, functional trainer with triple arm function. You know, if you have this triple arm functional trainer, Kaiser uh, unit. So it has two arms, uh, three arms, and you can do the full simulator to the same uh, particular fly stroke mechanics. Okay, so uh, you can uh, have minimal load in this, what you did, and to maximum amount. Uh, I think it's 215 newtons. Also can be put into this. So we put video cameras and uh, see this was actually with elect wired electrodes actually. So standing position, pulling it. Okay. And we also did something uh, isometric actions. So here you can see in this EMG uh, cash portion, that is entry portion, uh, anterior deltoid. So if you see a right anterior deltoid, actually a right shoulder injury, so right anterior deltoid is activating and biceps bracket also of right is activating. And supposed to be the pectoralis, the left pectoralis actually supposed to start activating, but here you see the right pectoralis is not activating. And in first point is supposed to activate to a great extent, but here it's not activating. This is the 180 degree, that is catch portion. Now if you look at uh, a 90 degree portion, that is almost the force application phase. Actually I did in various phases, but I am just cutting the thing into three phases. At 90 degree phase, see the anterior deltoid is activating to a great extent, right anterior, okay. And uh, supposed to be not activating, the pectoral is supposed to act is activating in left, but in right it is not activating. Okay. <coughs> and in the post application phase, 80 degree, same results. And in the next phase, 30 phase, okay, you see pectoral is still not activating in right, injured shoulder but anterior deltoid is active. So what I told was the position of the shoulder. In the morning we had the example of the, how the force application. 
orientation of wrist, elbow, and shoulder in relation to the post application phase. So when you have it in parallel like this, okay, then the pectoral activation is greater. But if the orientation of the elbow is higher than the wrist and shoulder, then you are cutting off the pectoral and you are activating the anterior tendon. So the same thing was happening here. So for this athlete, so we had to we went even into underwater to see. See, relatively, the elbow is pushed up, already the wrist is down in relation to that. Okay, so in underwater also, when we put the camera and saw that, okay, the technique what is doing in water also is similar to what we saw here, the activation here pattern, what is being seen here. So, this was a problem of wrong technique. So, we had to stop the activities of the athlete for quite some time and correct the technique properly in land, then only we made him to go into back into the water. So, identifying an issue of the technique, it helps, okay. Now, this is the uh, vastus lateralis there and rehabilitation of the weight lifter. So, we, did, uh, we put uh, so many electrodes, it goes right away. So, this after 12 weeks of rehab done, the testing is being done. So, if you look into, okay, we put on front and half, okay in knee extension exercise and also leg press. Now one thing here which I want to tell you, when you are doing a knee extension, we will have a practical also, when the foot position, the ankle joint, now in relation to this one is quite okay, because this is parallel and it is parallel to tibia, okay, you are resting point is parallel to tibia, so it is quite okay. But what I wanted to say, if the position of the foot is higher, okay, then the knee extension contraction, that is the core contraction activation will be greater. If the foot position is lower than the knee joint, okay, then calf activation will be also at a higher rate as compared to the core. Now, the angle which you are setting for a testing needs to be clear. Okay, in which angle you are testing. Because all the performance depends upon that. Now even certain things like orientation of the foot, if it is about vastus laterals activation will be cut off and vastus medialis activation will be greater. If it is inverted, Vastus activations, lateral uh, activation will be greater and media, vastus medians activation will be cut off. So, orientation of foot also changes the activation pattern. But, so that's why I said that initially you need to understand the mechanics correctly. In which orientation you are doing the test and in which angle you are testing. Okay. Now, <coughs> so in this, if you look into Vastus medialis is activation in leg press, okay. So when the athlete was lifting a weight of 237, you find that, okay, the left leg activated less, whereas this is in double leg, that's leg press, that means both the leg together, okay. And the right was activating more. So actually, why right is activating more, left is injured one, right is activating more, because it is compensating the load on the right side and left is only just supporting in the knee extension. So that's why there is not much of equal activation. Whereas when you look into single left, so in order to make sure that okay, left is activating less, so we have to isolate the legs while testing. So the left leg was taking a weight of 180 kg maximum, and you saw that okay, the activation is 103 only, whereas right leg is in the position to go for taking higher load of 200 kg, and activation is relatively higher, 1.5. Okay. So, if you look into, again, depending upon the street, higher the weight they have taken, so this compensation was basically because of right leg being stronger, it is in the position to compensate the effort of left. Okay. So, you, in lateral, uh, versus lateral is also similar 
you can find left leg activation V36. Okay, this it is because single leg activation has I mean, so it was the injured condition, it is activating the greater, but right leg activation 200 kg but lower. Okay, so activation is relatively low. So it, with higher load, activation with lower efficiency, the muscle is in the position to perform. Now, rectus right femoris, if you look into leg press, <coughs> you find similar uh, activation pattern as of the uh, vastus lateralis. The knee extension also similar uh, thing, but when you look into uh, the similar conditions as in that of leg press, uh, Skip this. Going into actual lifting pattern, okay, where the person is doing the half squat. So in half squat, you can see with 70 kg activation is higher. With 90 kg, the activation starts to be less for vastus medialis and vastus lateralis. But for rectus femoris, it is increasing. So you find here rectus femoris. As a control, what's actually happening? When lighter weight is there, it is in the position to do it properly. But heavier loading is done, the main muscle which is actually contracting, it is shifting everything to that. And it's trying to streamline the orientation of the knee joint and focus on rectus permanence instead of focusing on vastus and medias. Now, whereas in right leg, non injured leg, you can see. With an increase in load, 70 kg to 90 kg, the activation pattern also is gradually increasing, which is actually a good sign. Okay. Now, in clean and jerk condition, okay. So these are the stages of clean and jerk. Uh, set up, dip and drive, split and lunge, and recovery. That is the final phase. So here you can see in jerk. As and when the weight is increased from 60, 70 to 90 kg, the vastus, uh, the medialis, is, there is activation, but then it's almost same. Vastus lateralis, that is the injured leg, as and when the weight is lifted, there is actually a great dip in the, uh, uh, there is activation pattern. Whereas vastus femoris, uh, there is an increase. So the load again is being compensated into <coughs> rectus femoris. So when you are lifting from vastus lateralis, it is actually going, the effort is going into rectus femoris. Now when you see right side, there is always an increase in performance. That means with increase in 60, 70, 90 kg, the muscle activation pattern also is increasing. So this is actually the way that should be. So this athlete, we decided, okay, we will not clear it for the sport because he is compensating. So higher the load weight, if he is compensating like this for vascular stand and recover. For the lift technique, the insert position is wider stance. So the vascular lateral axis activation is real greater. So higher load if it takes, then again the vascular lateral axis is to be, is likely to be injured. So we didn't want him to go for higher load because this is likely to make the athlete further get an injury. So not clearing the athlete for the actual sporting, he has to still continue his rehab. That's the outcome of this uh, study. Okay. Now this is bike fitting. Okay. For every uh, cycle you buy need to fit the athlete into the bike. Okay. You because the lift segments, all those things are different. And if you are not doing a proper bike fitting, then they are likely to get low back injury or knee problems, knee joint problems. Because uh, the force application phase varies in according to the segments and uh, the length of the limbs and etc. Okay. So what happened in this case was that this boy's father was uh, a very passionate internet internet suffering, uh, suffering guy. 
So he found out all the things of bike fitting from Newton that. And he did it on his son, son's bike. But then the son, after some time, started saying that, okay, I'm getting knee pain. So he realized why the knee pain is causing He doesn't know what is the problem. So he wanted to test our biomechanics. So he brought them to our biomechanics. So when we came to we came to know that okay, this guy's intention is something like this only. He is testing us also. We have to also prove our thing. So what we did, okay, we put in. Best thing is like this. Someone is testing you. Your ability means okay. You prove it by scientific method. Counter it by some scientific method. And prove that they are wrong. So we put EMG. When we put EMG, initially the way you can see here, So the blue ones are before we did the bike fitting. So you see the calf, calf muscles, okay? Left lateral calf, medial calf, right was activating higher. And the quadriceps muscles, which is supposed to produce greater force, are activating relatively less. So this is what actually is happening. The athlete is doing cycling on more of plantar flexion rather than making use of his knee extension. He is on his foot, ankle joint. <coughs> okay, so what I have a picture of that, uh, sorry, that the pressure on that, okay, when he is actually doing the cycling, his portion of plantar flexion was greater. And when we uh, did the bike fitting according, accordingly, you see this quadriceps activating, rectus femoris activating more, okay. Versus left is still activating greater and the calf muscles activation is reduced. So we have switched over from calf muscle working to quadriceps muscle working and making the quadriceps muscle to work in a better and efficient way that will facilitate more force production. So we have to adjust his seat height, position of the seat in terms of how far you need to sit from the handle. You need to look into the uh, pedal portion. We need to look into the handle portion, height of the handle. All those things we adjusted and made this athlete to go in a better condition than what he was. Okay. Now, this is a athlete having EA joint pain. Basically, uh, when we did the testing, we found that, okay, see, there is actually when he is doing uh, walking, uh, you find, see, landing, lateral aspect, then the central pressure travels backward, medially, and then again, in, in the push phase, it is going up. So there was an issue with the iliac, sacroiliac joint. Okay, the striped part in the sacroiliac joint was relatively poor. <coughs> that had to be corrected through various exercises. So un uh, understanding the mechanics in that particular angle of exercising is to be noted first. And based on that, you need to set the exercises. You need to do the workout based on the particular angle to in which portion this uh, this is actually retrieving back. So from that angle, you need to set the angle of exercising for sacroiliac joint. <coughs> now this is something an interesting part because this was a shooter. So this guy had 20 years of experience. Now this shooter had uh, you know thoracic outlet syndrome, muscle atrophy and possible nerve impingement, okay, so in the shoulder joint. Now the funny thing is that he is going and standing in a competition, he is ready to shoot fire, when he is going to trigger, he will shoot the opponent's target. Point is for the opponent. He doesn't miss. Target is on empty, no points for him. But he is 
scoring points for the opponent. So what was actually happening? When he is a book, pull the trigger, there is an activation from the anterior deltoid that makes the shift in the position. So what we did, we put EMG on the right arm, you can see that. And the target is set, high speed camera is kept there. And you see a red color thing here? Okay, so that is actually a laser light which we attach to the pistol. And wherever the laser light went, we track the moment, how it's holding and when it's actually. So when you are about to shoot the star, the thing is coming down so when you. So this was relatively a shorter range, right? Means actually it's on a close plate in standing. So we are looking into also if there is any shift in body position or not. And plus EMG we targeted together to understand what is actually happening. So main thing was triggering of anterior deltoid because of atrophy that has taken place. So the nerve when actually your index finger is pulling, it is actually obstructing the uh, shoulder thoracic uh, shoulder thoracic joint area and that is triggering the anterior deltoid activation. So that was the reason which actually made him trigger. So what we did was a simple thing. Six months no shooting. If at all you want to shoot, you shoot with left hand. Okay. You are trained with left hand. And meanwhile, focus on development of right shoulder joint. When he came back, he shoots the problem all fall because infringement has been now rectified because of better stunt training. Shoulder has become bigger. The atrophy has gone relatively. And uh, hypertrophy has taken place. And he went on to perform after that. <coughs> so these are some of the uh, peak of muscle activity in uh, shooter with thoracic uh, outlet syndrome which uh, we did. Okay. Then this is an EMG on shooter with low back pain. Again looking into various aspects. So what we did was that this shooter normally they do 40 shots in one minute or one hour. When it's actually standing, first 10 shots under no low back pain. But as and when the number of shots increase, because in shooting competition, 40 shots you have to take. So as and when the duration of the training or competition is increasing, he gets the back pain. So that muscular endurance and core endurance, core strength endurance is not there. So we look into left thoracic and right thoracic and the shooting performance. So these were all shooting performance, looking at the tracking of uh, left thoracic screw and right thoracic. Okay, so this blue one is left thoracic and right. And you need to understand what are the changes that is taking place. So where actually is dropping, where is going out, those information are very critical in identifying okay, how long an activity exercise has to be prolonged in order to help the athlete to endure for core strength. So various types of core strength exercise was introduced to him with weights, without weights, with single leg, single leg stands, double leg stands and so on. And with uh, more number of uh, core activity sessions, these issues could be sorted out to a great extent. Well. Yeah. So this again, okay, I just skip that. So these are all different uh, events. People they had problems. Uh, right there, right there, people also had similar issues. Looking into that, yeah. So it's almost same type of study. Okay. Uh, in certain cases, we also added uh, what are footwear to look into central pressure and where actually during the stands. If you don't have a portable I mean, force, force plate or portable force plate to be placed there in the shooting range, then we have to look into for a force pressure, uh, foot pressure. Foot pressure, uh, a quota unit was put on his leg, and we could look into okay, what is the uh, you know, force or pressure on the foot during the shooting. 
So that also adds on to that. Now here actually there is something like 560 on right side and 497 on the left side. Now this is mainly because the athlete and is having the pistol on the right side and you know raising up the hand on uh, makes the center of gravity to be shifted more toward the right side. So that's way greater force on right foot you find. Okay, so this is actually a badminton player so having shoulder injury. Uh, bank card, shoulder, arthroscopy, repair done and breath section and the grip done also done. So this, this is the athlete. Uh, she was actually 2016 uh, Olympics Rio. She was a gold uh, silver medalist in mixed mixed WWE. Okay. So these are some of the data what we can make, uh, uh, that is captured uh, from right shoulder lateral external rotation. And one of the thing was that okay after this athlete went for uh, rehab and uh, the coach wanted to know that whether this athlete is cleared for training or not. Uh, so the doctor, the team of doctors, biomechanics, conditioning experts, physiotherapists all were there while doing the uh, testing. And uh, we went for looking into two actions, dummy action. Okay, dummy action of backward swing. So the problem was that when the athlete is doing a backward swing, no house and issue. So after we have fun months of we have, she came. So when you was, she was doing backward, you can see backward action without shuttle. And there was a backward swing action with shuttle. Okay, so you see the shuttle uh, coming in. And the person is exiting. Now, when we presented the EMT result to the coaches and doctors, we found that, okay, when the athlete is doing the activity with the shuttle, the activation was less. When the athlete is doing without shuttle, dummy action, without shuttle, just dummy action, the other side with shuttle. Okay, so when the athlete was doing without shuttle, muscle is activating more. So the doctors said that we cannot clear the athlete because under the active heaven, with the shuttle when she is doing, there is no muscle activation, so that must be some problem. You got got the thing? The concept is with shuttle, there is no muscle activation. Without shuttle, there is muscle activation. So the doctor is saying, here yeah, in badminton court, you will be playing with shuttle. No, so if muscle is not activated, then why how can we send you for uh, clearance? We cannot allow you to go and play. So you only train, you keep on doing your rehab first for more time, then only you will be clear. Then I told them, coach and doctor, listen, you see this, okay, the posture of the body is erect. When you want, <coughs> taking back swing, if the muscles in the back need to contract, you have to apply force backward. You see the next picture? What is the posture of the body? Leaning backward. Now if we are holding a shuttle like this, leaning backward, badminton racket like this, leaning backward. What is happening? The gravitational pull of the gravitational pull facilitates the racket to go. You don't have to take it back. Automatically the weight of the racket is actually plus the segments weight body segment's weight is allowing the thing to fall back. So if you are not activating the muscle voluntarily, involuntarily it is being activated. Okay. So there may not be a real activation there. Because gravitation 
thing is facilitating it, why the uh, athlete needs to do it backward? You know? You don't have to pull backward like that. So when your body is going through, okay, she was doing straight, then you need to have activation backward. But when the body is, because she is facing the shuttle, automatically the body is tilted back. So the gravitational pull facilitates the racket to fall backward and that that makes the muscle not to work. It need not work. So the activate, even if the muscle is not activated, no issue because it is only gravitational pull that is facilitating the muscle activation. I mean that, that technique to be done. So finally, our explanation helped the athlete to get back into the sport. Because we cleared the athlete based on the technical aspect and otherwise the doctors didn't have that concept or that position, body position. So that made uh, them to have a different opinion. Okay. So understanding the technique, as I told you, understanding the technique and interpreting the data is quite important. Now, this is uh, another uh, athlete, a sailor having knee injury. Okay, she was diagnosed having problem malaria, patella, grade three in both legs. She used to get the pain specifically while doing the trapeze. Trapeze is this technique. Okay, on the pole. Okay. So what we did was that okay, we never had. Uh, um, Electronics and water does not go together. So we cannot take the you know all these electrodes into sea and make the athlete to do the testing because all those things will get spoiled. So what we had to do, we had we put a bench and on a wall bar we put chain and ask the athlete to do the trapezing action in the uh, bench. So the orientation of the foot actually was bit averted in her actual technique, okay, and uh, we actually uh, asked her to have a parallel stance, okay. So see here, the foot is slightly overturned. When the sh uh, knee joint is actually, I mean, when you have a overturned foot. And if you are spotting like this, doing a trapeze movement like this, then you are sure to get knee joint pains. Okay, so that was one of the cause for the knee joint issue. Having foot diverted, right side foot diverted, and you are compensating that onto the. So what happens? The knee in squatting position is actually split both the side. So groin is actually split, and compensating the squat movement. <coughs> so. When we did the test, we found that okay, less muscle activation from cortisol in new technique resulting in better muscular energy conversation. Uh, conversation. That is what we only just did was that we focus okay, this foot instead of having the uh, vertebral portion, both will have parallel portion where knee joint is flexed under natural anatomical position. So issues of knee joint reduce with correction of this particular technique and that helps the athlete to do the, see, you can see, foot parallel, doesn't have much issue, <coughs> okay. So yeah, then another thing what they need to do is something, only one correction in the technique, so here you can see that uh, knee joint is behind it. the foot. Uh, placement in the trapezing. So in actual trapezing, if you can place the knee joint vertical in relation to the board, then the execution of uh, trapezing is relatively easy. If it is like this inclined, then you tend to have always isometric contraction of knee joint. In this isometric contraction of knee joint is there, but it is under flex condition, so in resting position. So not much of problem for the knee joint. <coughs> so this is the muscle activation pattern of Archer. 36 arrows he was shooting. And this is the 
Archer who is doing in wheelchair, wheelchair. Okay. So you, you can see here this left middle deltoid is never consistent, but rest of the muscles are not consistent. And even right middle deltoid, that means the left middle unit is the holding one, the bow holding one, and right middle deltoid is the one which is actually pulling the bow. Okay, that is the the thread. And these two are not consistent. So what actually happens is that when you look into the scores of the athlete, because of these changes in these two muscles activation pattern, sometimes here, sometimes there, or luckfully, it's not consistent. It's not accurate according to the training required. Where you target almost in the middle of the target, but it's all going wide. So stabilization of the deltoid muscles, right medial and left medial deltoid needs to be done. The full angle, all those things need to be streamlined. Even a slight change, lifting the elbow up or pulling it back or drawing it outward or drawing it downward, all can change the functioning of the deltoid muscle. So first, the athlete needs to stabilize. Okay. So once stabilization of the muscles are being done specifically according to the angle of foot, then these issues can be rectified and the athlete will have consistency in shooting of the arrows. Because of 
attraction and there is concentric and eccentric activation of the rhomboid muscles and that will lead to injuries in the rhomboid. So to cut the set, we, we saw that we calculated all that aspect and we didn't clear this admin unless he rectifies his problems for uh, that his VR is continued and improve his strength part to a greater extent. So uh, this I already discussed. Yeah. So in general, uh, use of EMT can help sportsmen to perform movements with proper muscle function and coordination. In elite sports, where the difference between the athletes is bare minimum, just gaining one percent in one percentage in improvement in terms of muscle performance and coordination, precise use of technique would result in an edge of winning performance to winning performance. So in clinical, it would assist the physio to channel and shaping of muscle to the functional demand of the sport. All right, with that, yes, uh, I'll point up. Any questions? Any questions? Yes, please. Two athletes are performing 
half squat or something. Uh -huh. we, are, we are going to find out. We are going to find out the muscle activation, the same muscle for the both of these. Uh, the muscle activation comes like uh, 1 person, 2 millivolt, 1 person, 3 millivolt for aggressive person. Uh, how to find out which person activation is more like changes? Is there any standard norms like back to back activation? It's only unusual actually. You have to, that's why I said, <coughs> see, you have to look into voluntary contraction of the muscle first. Okay. Now, let's say in voluntary contraction, the muscle is in a position to produce around uh, 200 millivolts for one person. Okay. So that is his 100 percentage. In voluntary, maximum voluntary contraction he is producing uh, 200 millivolts. And in the actual execution, he produces only 175 I mean 150, let's say 150 uh, millivolts. Now this is converted into percentage. 150 divided by 200 into 100 percentage. So you find 75 percentage activation by this athlete. And same way if you can do for the other athlete, you find out, okay, based on his maximal voluntary contraction, he must have only uh, done something around 180. Based on that, if he has uh, performed 150, okay, so 150 divided by 180 into 100 per six. Then compare the percentage. Okay, this guy is in a position to do 75 percentage, this guy may be in a position to do around 60 percentage. Now, this all the six depends. Uh, this, I don't know if I have that. Uh, activating in the same thing. 
so that impact is coming to the straighter. But if there is a flexion in the knee, but still landing on heel, then the impact is more on ankle joint and arm. Okay. If there is too much of weight which is falling on back, eccentric contractions is taking place on the axle. And also concentric contraction is taking place in the core. But since the leverage is more, if because of brake force and this one, then you tend to have people having, you know, core pull or because of excess of eccentric and conversion into a concentric part. That time there could be core force that is taking place. So the impact is on transfer of things which are actually while landing. Then impact is again running on road. Okay, hard surface. If we run on surfaces, hard surface like this, then impact is greater. If you are running on sand or water, same way, impact is lesser on lower back. You get So depending upon the surfaces where we are landing, running, that also plays an important uh, aspect in terms of stresses on this. Yes. Any other? Yeah, a small doubt. Huh? Not regarding this topic. It's a big doubt only. Don't worry. Yes, from the side, I am thinking that uh, through any principles, through any kind of principles, is there any chance to uh, make increase? Height of any age this morning. You mean to? I'm sorry, if a person is 18 or 19 age, uh, is there any chance of they can, any, through any principles or any scientific principles, they can? See, there was a huge advantage. As per the anthropology, there is actually a peak height gain age. Uh, the, for males it is different, females it is different, peak height, peak growth height. Once that is achieved, then after that you try to do anything in soft. Not going to facilitate. Maximum what you can do is to wear high heels shoes. <laughs> Very difficult. But see, early days, you know, the prediction of uh, height was actually based on parent, parental height. Okay, that is actually growth prediction, height prediction. When the child is around three years of age, he is supposed to be double the height of that particular three years. Okay, if he is around 90 centimeters main, okay, then the child will be 180 centimeters when he achieves the, growth, uh, the full growth. That was the prediction early days. But nowadays, uh, anthropology people have developed a lot of uh, equations for calculating the peak height, peak velocity of height, and it all depends upon uh, the nutrition which you are taking. Nowadays, you find even the children are much more taller than the parents. Okay, so there is all uh, in the world, uh, new type of uh, growth hormones which must have been injected or maybe the protein supplementation which was supposed to be given at the right time of nurturing that that form helps a lot if there is uh, no proper nutrition which is given at the right age of growth then growth is stunted so you must do a lot of research on that okay what is the peak height age or what is the time when the nurturing needs to be done, you know. So those things need to be understood. Now it's like plant, watering a plant. In summer season, you need to water the plant to actually keep your head, that plant to grow. Rainy season, you don't have to do watering. So there are stages in uh, the growth and development. 
where your speed factor improves, where your strength factor improves, your flexibility quality is uh, remaining or it starts to reduce. Those kind of things need to be studied. Child, a small child, you know, is in that particular age is very flexible. So, a lot of studies have to be done on growth and development and long term pattern and because of this kind of junk foods uh, which are coming these days, the growth pattern also is varying and uh, yeah, that can, that can be good for or can. Thank you. 
very sound of all this uh, technology. I, I, I was actually setting up a syllabus for one of the universities in India for biomechanics. So the person who was in charge of the biomechanics uh, in that particular university, when I told about motion analysis, inverse dynamics, all these things need to be included in the syllabus. He said, no, 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 we don't want all these things in the syllabus. We only teach basics. They feel that they don't know first of all. So they feel that, okay, students also only should be below my nose. They should not go above my nose in knowledge. If you go above my knowledge, then I'll be thrown off. That is the kind of feeling they have. If they have that kind of feeling, then our education system is not proper. We are not delivering properly the education to the people. So how to share the education, how best the syllabus needs to be, that has to be, you know, streamlined from time to time. Every time there should be a progress. It's not the same syllabus continued from now NIS, National Institute of Sport, Diploma. <coughs> the syllabus of 1961 is still continuing. There has been little revamp, but still same. So there has not been a good progress in coaching. The problem is all stagnant, you know. What they were earlier coaches used to coach, same thing we are following. I took the technology of sports performance to our uh, sports performance analysis to our coach one of the hockey coach in India in 2004. So we had a demo of the technology now. But you see a game situation, 70 minutes. Can you remember all this game situation? It's difficult. And as a coach, you are watching 11 players play. How do you can remember all the 11 players position in terms of the ball? when a goal was scored or when you considered a goal. You have to actually analyze that all from video. Only then you will come to know that. So the technology was shown to the coach. <coughs> the coach says, coaching is all here. We don't want the technology. <laughs> I think so. This question related to this mechanical grouping. Huh? Technology. Mechanical technology like grouping. That facilitates sports results. So for example, uh, shoe, centimeter of shoe, or the height of the shoe, may facilitate the running speeds. Yes. There is legal standards. Above that standard, maybe get the results. This year, cancer the KPN results, KPN athlete results, marathon results. Such like so, uh, technological uh, shoe or materials considered as doping. I think so. This question is going to do this one. Am I correct? Just like this one, there is another uh, technologies like India. Around here, Bangalore, 36 meters above sea level. In Ethiopia, there is 1,000 or 3,000 or 400 above sea levels. We can apply Ethiopian air condition or altitude in India with artificial acclimatization or acclimatization. That is not legal, not normal, not natural, artificial. Such like of condition facilitates the speed of an athlete. Yeah. That is mechanical condition. So, mm -hmm. is there any standards such like of uh, technologies considered as legal or illegal? See, there is environmental changes <coughs> which are available these days. Environmental changes. So you can set your environmental conditions according to uh, the altitude where you are actually going to participate in the competition. Okay. So uh, this environment.
one minute chambers, if you can train inside that certain amount of percentage of oxygen that will, which is actually as per the oxygen amount available in that particular it is quite possible. So there are uh, environmental chambers in Bangalore, there is one in uh, Patiala, there is one in, uh, I think in Delhi or in three. So, uh, only thing, the training, load dynamics needs to be planned very systematically in that. There is an adapted first part because when you go from a free, I mean, a low altitude into an environmental chamber where I want to be, the adaptation process has to be uh, planned properly. Otherwise, what will happen is that uh, automatically it can create a lot of uh, uh, issues in the athlete and they may not be in a position to prolong the activity for longer time. So, and how to get adapted to those kind of things needs to be also.
shifting of your the other leg. Okay, how you are shifting? As one you are pivoting. Now, if you look into uh, certain things where actually you are retrieving back, you are retrieving sideways. If you change the orientation angle of your retrieval to this position, you are making use of bigger group of muscle in retrieving back. So, your reaction push back is much faster as compared to sideways push back. Okay, there are some people what they do, they, when they try to revert, that is retrieve. They pivot like this, then push back with actual movement. So the time loss. How how you are making it? I uh, mean, you, your uh, stance, stance there during the retrieval is all depending upon what orientation of the stack or what orientation of defense you want to follow. It's some of that. So coaches should look into small, small technical things. Okay, pivoting. How do you need to pivot? You get up from this. You are changing your directions immediately without pivoting. You are pushing like this, then you are likely to get injured. So, how turn pivoting? Shift the weight to forward foot, pivot on the ball of the foot. Quickly, you can turn faster. Your turning time also will increase. Your reaction also will be relatively much better. So, small, small things. Uh, if you can show me some skill, I can tell you okay whether it is okay or not or how far you may need to modify the technique. Depends on skill. But it is difficult sir, because there are a lot of big movements are there in the moment. Sudden movements are there. It is difficult or not. So I can No, you can I am mean, saying. In the game situation. The game situation is there. There are certain things which are actually unavoidable, then you can do it. But sir, there are certain things. I will give one situation, uh -huh. sir, in Coco. Uh -huh. After covering the leg, uh -huh. so we need to turn back to the giving. So, like V uh, shape. Uh, v shape, like uh, we, are going, we are going like this. Uh -huh. So, immediately we need to turn back. So, how we, what kind of uh, uh, these things you have without getting any injury? Now see, if you are having, now in this position, if your left leg is in front, yes. and then you want to suddenly turn, ah, like issues of injury. Yeah. When you want to turn, your right leg should be in front, and then you are changing direction, it is faster and easier. Your angle of attack, you need to convert it in according to your intelligence, and according to your thing. Okay, so change of direction. You take your best possible advantage situation and then change. You change in a difficult situation, then 100% in injury. So, same thing. Now, uh, see here in left leg leading case, what is actually happening? You have to actually rotate more and then turn your body. So, your reaction time and your turning time is going to be more. more. Now, when you have it in right leg, your turning time is lateral and it will be much faster and push up all in there, that will make you to go much faster. What do I say? Then, acceleration. In the first step, if you take a long stride for going and trying to catch the person, you will not catch it. You want to accelerate, shorter step, allow the circle of gravity to fall forward and quickly accelerate. If you take long step, Shift your line of centrography from here to here. By the time you finish, the person would have gone out. So, small, small things you need to observe. <coughs> sir, I have a problem. For this printer, sir, lateral muscles influencing is there? Any, any influences are the person that the lateral muscles are the printer? Muscle, 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 muscle,
the process of cooling down, it is actually increasing your speed of the segment of your upper extremity. So it doesn't give any issue. Right? Well, swinging. swinging. Well, swinging arms. Now, see, it is only V shaped body. If it is like this, if it is like mine, now I am actually 61 years old. So, uh, my abdomen has gone forward. So, actually, if I have a body like this, my hip wider, then it is negative. But if you have a body this way, V shaped, you are swinging, shoulder is outside the line of hip joint. So, there is no problem in you. Okay then, uh, I think uh, uh, we'll often we'll have some uh, testing, exercising, and some corrections. We we'll won't ask any corrections.